So we're going to talk about, uh, Cherry's going to talk about spatial data, which uh, is becoming more and more important. Uh, if you think about um, big data and, and, and data being generated from every application that you, you, people use these days, uh, they need to be time stamped and they need to have a location in, in order to use them. And um, the accuracy of that location depends upon how it's going to be used. Um, location, position accuracy, um, it's never been more important. But how do we achieve that and how is that changing? I'm going to leave that up to uh, Thierry to, uh, to tell us. So we've got about 40 minutes and then we'll have time for questions before uh, Wine and Crisps. So I'll uh, hand it over to Thierry. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ed. Um, appreciate the invitation and the introduction. Are you able to hear me? Is this on? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Um, yeah, so thank you for, for having me here. Um, um, I'm also glad to see that uh, at least a few of you turned up because of the predicted tube disruption today. Uh, I came to the office today, our office at Axprodar where I work, and it was literally empty. And so um, I traveled from Axda because I work from home, and um, it's always nice to come up to the office to chat with people, and there was nobody there. <laughs> um, so yeah, so um, I'm going to spend the next half hour or so talking about spatial. Um, um, and as Ed said, um, we work together in the same industry, oil and gas, a little bit of renewables as well I've, I've worked in. And um, I've been in geospatial for, working in geospatial for about 20 years, 25 years. And um, I've worked in other sectors as well, environment, land and property. And uh, so the presentation uh, tonight is really from my personal perspective. I don't represent anybody here. Um, I'm currently, uh, I've been working for Xproduct uh, for the last six years now. Uh, we're part of the GTEC group. Uh, GTEC is a geoscience data company who acquired Xprodot three years ago. And uh, Xprodot, we're a GIS consultancy uh, specializing in, in oil and gas services. Um, and and other, increasingly other sectors as well, also working on the energy transition. Um, so, yeah, where, oh, there it is. Um, so what I was going to talk about, um, yeah, I realize I need to keep looking back because there's no screen here. <laughs> I keep looking. <laughs> um, so I was going to talk a little bit about the evolution of, of GIS. Um, just so I know, who knows what GIS is? Okay, almost everyone. So I'll skip over that fairly quickly. So, uh, well, I wasn't sure. So, uh, so yeah. So I'll spend a little bit of time talking about spatial data and why um, it is maybe special, maybe not. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that up to you to decide. Um, I'm talking a little bit what's going on more recently, the frontiers of, of spatial data. Um, and then I want to switch gears a bit and talk a, bit, a little bit about being, with all these automation optimization, but also being human in, in this new digital world, which is something that's very close to my heart. Uh, and then I'll wrap up with some final thoughts. So uh, I always like to start a presentation with, with a with an eye-catching image. Um, so since we're talking about spatial tonight, I, I thought this might be um, quite a nice image to look at. Um, I don't know how old it is. It's one of those internet memes that goes around the interwebs. And um, well, clearly, it's, it's dealing with spatial data. These gentlemen there, they're drawing maps. Um, I think it's in America. Probably looks like it could be just after the war, between the war, I don't know, between the world wars. Um, and on one hand, I'm thinking, oh, it's great, isn't it, how far we have come that we don't have to do this anymore. But on the other hand, I'm also thinking, oh, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be great if we could still draw, draw maps like this uh, rather than staring at screens all day long? So, and, and that's kind of the gist of my presentation as well. So, um, so yeah, just quickly then, since, you, since most of you know what a GIS is, um, here's a definition from 1995. At that stage, GIS was already at least 25 years old. Um, so GIS is a computer system, which is, I guess, why I'm giving a talk here at the BCS, um, uh, which is capable of holding and using um, spatial data. Um, so not just holding, but even using. I mean, it would be fairly useless if it was only holding data, but you couldn't use it. But I guess in those days, usability was still an issue. And uh, relating to the Earth's surface. So, uh, whereas these days, it's not just the Earth's surface, it's literally everywhere, above, below, and even other planets. Uh, so with GIS, 
obviously, um, it's all about spatial data, but the key is, is about spatial layers. You know, you, you're really overlaying data, and it's that that makes um, GIS really unique in terms of how it integrates data and how you can then see trends in, in data. Um, and what you see is the map. So most people assume a GIS is just a map, but what you don't see is what's underneath all of that, which is what all the hard work is, all the, all between the yummy bits, all the, all, all, well, this is about to say, to the cake layers, um, which is where all the data work happens, the cleaning, the formatting, the analyzing, and all the rest of it. Um, and then this is what GIS looks like. You can literally use it for anything. Um, this is a screenshot I made in 2004, and it's really funny. Every time I look to update this slide, I'll troll the web, and I can't find any better screenshots. <laughs> so um, it's, in terms of interface, not much has changed in GIS, but what's really changed is how it's being used and, and how it's deployed and, and all of that, really. So, so yeah, and of course, you all know um, GIS, because you all have it on your phones these days. Um, this is probably um, the largest GIS in the world and the most complex, even though all you see is a map. But what's behind that map is, <coughs> is an absolutely huge infrastructure, and you wouldn't believe how, how much effort and, and investment goes into that. So GIS has evolved from you know, project work where you have everything on a PC that you load stuff on with a floppy disk, and um, through to enterprise GIS to a geospatial platform and now the, now the cloud, of course. So, um, which means that it's all become accessible anywhere to anyone uh, on any device. You can literally use it in any way you like. Um, this is an Azure example. Uh, by the way, most of my screenshots are Azure examples because Xproduct, we're an Azure partner, but you could replace this just as easily with open source versions of this because um, they also exist, obviously. So I'm not here to promote any particular product. Uh, I have no interest in doing that. Um, and what's changed also is that you don't have these laborious stacks anymore. And I remember this from my early days working for a really large multinational uh, was responsible for deploying GIS around the world to 25 different offices. And it was just a bloody nightmare, frankly because uh, you had to deal with the IT department, everything was in-house, and you had to deal with, with Azure, in that case, the vendor. Uh, you had our internal GIS teams, and then you had the users at the very end of that long chain, and actually, all the amount of effort that went into, in, into like the bottom three layers almost precluded you from having any user interaction, which was, of course, completely the wrong way around. <clears throat> and, um, and that's really what's changed now with the cloud. So. If you don't want to engage with any of that stuff, you don't have to, because you can leave it to other people, and you, you can use that, that infrastructure, um, which you all know, of course, because you know, as IT people, I'm, I'm preaching to the converted here. But, uh, but then again, I'm seeing a little bit of a sense of deja vu, not just with the cloud, which is a bit like going back 30 years to like, like these mainframe terminals. You know, I remember being at uni, you had like uh, this, um, what were they called? These Unix terminals, all, all, all linked to a huge mainframe. And, um, and the cloud is a bit like that again. And also, with the, when you hear all this talk about APIs, and with spatial data, you see that a lot now as well, because integration has always been an issue across applications. And uh, so, yeah, just throw an API at it, and you'll be fine. And that reminds me a bit like when Oracle Spatial first came out, and we were all saying, yeah, let's stick it all in Oracle, and then any application can read it. And um, that worked out with more or less success, and I'm wondering whether APIs will go the same way. But the key thing, really, is that GIS has, on, on its journey over the years, over 20 years, GIS has really moved from being like this PC-centric or GIS a centric world where everything has to go into the GIS and back out, uh, which then also causes these issues. I've had millions of conversations like these where geologists say, why do I need GIS? I can just annotate a JPEG. Um, where it's, you know, you can move from this to, to like more sprinkling spatial magic everywhere. So ensuring that all IT applications can consume spatial data, not just GIS, so that you can just have spatial data flow across the landscape uh, more easily. And, and it's really that way that, that, that you do the integration. 
Um, and, and you want to increase usage that way. Because in the past, YAS was really difficult to use, and you couldn't really force people to use it if they only needed a little bit of it. And, and that's really changed now. And I'll see that also the last few years working as a consultant. Um, it's become a lot easier to, to enter um, new areas where, where spatial data can get useful. So within large organizations, it's a lot easier to deploy. It's a lot easier to get new users onto it. And um, yeah, it's a lot better, actually. And also, of course, what you have on your phones you know, is as a result of that evolution. Having said that, um, and, and this being like a bit of data management special interest group, um, what I also see is that um, you know, some things refuse to go away. Um, as, as we like the shapefile, which is the Excel of the GIS world, um, shapefile usage apparently uh, is on an upward trend despite all of the slick integration and cloud platforms and all of that. Because it's still just very easy to import and export. It's still very easy to email a shapefile to somebody. And um, it's interesting. You see that these two, two trends competing within one another. And um, I wonder if this will ever change. I doubt it, to be honest. But um, it's interesting to see. OK, so that was a quick tour around the GIS evolution. Um, I want to talk a little bit about spatial data and what um, what's really important about it, what, what's really unique about spatial data as opposed to other data. Um, and so to begin with, we just need to, need to define it. Um, spatial data is, is spatial because it relates to, to 2D or 3D spatial dimensions. Um, and then you have the term geospatial, which means it relates to the Earth. But spatial and geospatial are used interchangeably all the time, and I use them interchangeably as well. So I'm not making that distinction. Uh, but you have various types of geospatial or spatial data. So you have latitude and longitude, or you have projected data, and now you have the round Earth projected to, to a flat map. And then um, you also have spatial temporal data, which is um, mixed in with time uh, as an extra dimension. So <coughs> Um, IoT sensors are the archetypal spatial temporal data now, but also um, any data relating to time, like um, the weather forecast, you could say spatial temporal. Um, you could even say geology is spatial temporal, but it moves very slowly. Um, but geologists actually, <clears throat> and I've worked with geologists a lot, they actually they have a capacity in their brains to visualize a 4D picture and then explain that to another geologist, and they can communicate like that flawlessly. And it's really, for a lot of people, it's really hard to envision uh, how a three-dimensional Earth, you know, the subsurface, has changed over millions of years over time. Uh, and so that's why I say it is probably spatial temporal data, even though to most people it would look like static data. Um, and then where normal data and spatial data intersect is at a place called Null Island. <coughs> And um, if you've ever worked with spatial data, you will notice that when data gets corrupted or when corners aren't filled in, so they get allocated 0, 0 as coordinates, they all end up in this place called Null Island, which is a fictional place, but it has got a boy to mark it. Um, and all that data, all that crap data ends up on, on, that, on that boy. Uh, so. What always happens when uh, you spatialize a spreadsheet or you spatialize a, an oracle table or whatever, and then you look at it on the map and say, where has it gone? Just go and check Null Island. Chances are it's gone there. Uh, it could also be a scale issue. It, this type of thing happens when you load an AutoCAD model from an architect into your GIS, uh, which is completely different scale. And then you wonder where it's gone, and it's gone to offshore Africa. Um, so yeah, so spatial integrity is really what, what, make, what marks it out. And um, when you work with spatial data, you constantly deal with stuff like this. So um, I would hope this was not due to a geodetic issue with map projections, but it illustrates the problem quite well, especially when you have two teams doing different things. You know, you had one team planting trees, presumably, and the other team creating rectangular tree boxes. And, I don't know. No, you had one job. <laughs> and it's that kind of stuff that you deal with all the time with GIS. And it really does happen. 
And the way you can uh, check that is uh, here in London, obviously, when you go to the Prime Meridian in Greenwich, uh, you go there with a GPS receiver, and you can have the most accurate GPS receiver in the world, but it will not tell you zero degrees longitude when you stand on it. And that is because uh, the reference frames aren't the same. So the line that's marked on the ground was defined by the Royal Observatory more than 100 years ago, whereas the imaginary line on your GPS uh, is defined by the US Air Force. We used the global system um, in 1984, so and those two don't match. And indeed, you have hundreds of coordinate systems like that around the world that don't quite match for historical or scientific reasons. And um, you deal with that kind of thing quite a lot, um, especially when you work multinationally across borders, uh, which the oil industry is, is obviously... I remember we used to be driving Asri mad with their geodesy people because we kept telling them, you need to sort this out, you need to be clearer to people. Uh, because most people work on, on one coordinate system. Like in this country, everything works on the owner's survey grid, so you don't really have to worry about this too much. Um, but, um, but yeah, and you get issues like this. This was a real disaster. Um, uh, well, thankfully, nobody died, which was a miracle. But uh, what happened there is there was some confusion on a lake where an oil rig was drilling, and they'd misinterpreted the projection as a slightly different one, which meant that their position shifted to where they should have been by about 100 meters or so. And as a result of that, they drilled right through a mining shaft, which was beneath the lake. And in doing so, they drained the entire lake into the underground mine in a matter of minutes. They literally had only a few seconds to get off the rig on their inflatable and get to shore. In fact, the shore just disappeared because the whole lake disappeared down a huge sinkhole. And uh, yeah, it's amazing nobody died. But it's that kind of thing, and there's been quite a lot of these, these kind of disasters, but you don't hear about them because obviously nobody wants to advertise that, <laughs> that kind of thing. But when you've worked in the industry long enough, you come across these kind of things, um, and also in other industries, um, other sectors that work multinationally, uh, they, they do deal with that kind of issue quite a lot. This was another example uh, that I had the... Um, the pleasure of being CC'd on a number of years ago. It wasn't the company I was working for. It was another company in the Indian o Ocean. There was an oil rig that, were meant, that was meant to drill a, um, an exploration well close to the equator, but somebody had misread latitudes north as south or the other way around, can't remember. And as a result, they drilled 400 kilometers in the wrong place. And if you think that uh, a typical offshore well might cost $100 million, uh, it's quite an expensive mistake to make. Um, but, oops, I pressed the wrong button there, yeah, sorry. Uh, but it can happen anywhere. Here's a $300 million example. Um, not necessarily to do with map projection, but it was a similar problem to do with imperial units versus metric. There were two teams at NASA working in different units, and they didn't harmonize them before they integrated their systems. And um, yeah, I mean, the, I, could, I could go on forever with examples like this, but, um, but, the, but it's this where that makes spatial data quite unique in the sense that even if you think you know the location, you have a coordinate, just having a coordinate is not enough to know where something is because it all depends how it's been related to the Earth, um, which is a, a geodetic integrity uh, issue. So yeah, moving on then, um, so what's new in the, in the GIS space? Um, so obviously what's been happening is a lot of action on kind of 3D, 4D type of area. 3D has always been a bit problematic because of CPU power as well. And I mean, applications like AutoCAD have always done 3D really well, but that's, that's more like an, an engineering design tool. It's not really a geographical tool although you, you can use it as a, as a push at a, at a local scale. But, um, but that GS has really come on in this area, and then you add to that all the IoT type stuff, smart cities, and um, you have a whole new data world um, opening up um, that, that actually needs spatializing. Uh, or you have it for facilities. You, know, you get all these high-res 3D models now. Um, 
Uh, so it's no longer just on the surface of the Earth, like the early definition said. It's above, it's below the surface, what's happening in the subsurface. And it's getting higher and higher resolution. Um, so the key there is really to bring it all together, all these data streams, all these data sources. They need to be put together in a way that, that, that is right. Because otherwise you end up with these things like where trees don't match the boxes and stuff like that. So um, and that is really critical. That's where GIS kind of plays a role of, of being the spatial glue between all these data sets. Um, so integration via geography in a way. Um, and you can do anything now with GIS. So that's why I couldn't really, <clears throat> I, could, I could show you hundreds of screenshots of all the stuff you could do with GIS, but it's kind of pointless. The key is now, when I go to any GIS conference now and they announce new features, it's like, yeah, whatever. You just assume it can do what, what you need it to do. So the question then becomes, what problem are you going to solve with it? Uh, because also anyone can do it now. Um, so it's quite easy for end users to take things into their own hands and just, just do whatever with it. So you also have to kind of learn to, to let go of control, or at least you facilitate the things that are really important. So um, when I'm working uh, with organizations now, I try to tell them not to try and control everything in the geospatial data lifecycle, because it's impossible. It's more about playing a facilitating role where you make sure everything is right and helping your users do their own thing, really. Yeah, otherwise, yeah, you need to be careful. You, it's, it's so easy to create solutions just because you can. Uh, as a consultant, I see that all the time now. Um, so that's, that's really one of the things. And you see that with every technology now, not GIS. You, know, you can do anything with it. But you really, uh, the, the more we can do, the more we need to ask why, I think. That, that is, at least that's what I see as my role as, as consultant as well. And indeed, uh, you, you, you start seeing some examples where people are rolling back you know, high-tech stuff, like this US Navy example. A few years ago, they installed all, all slick touch screens across uh, their bridges. And uh, they were implicated in a number of collisions, um, simply because doing stuff on a screen isn't quite the same as having levers and wheels and handles because your brain doesn't respond the same way to it. And I'll talk about that a bit later as well. So uh, what they've done is actually rolled back some of those changes and uh, reintroducing levers and wheels and stuff because it simply works better. Um, also, you need to use the tools in the right context. You know, um, if you want to do this experiment, it actually works. It's quite funny watching, um, watching it. Um, if you do take... Uh, GPS on the train that's optimized for a road network and it tries to make you do U-turns or whatever. It can't quite match the road. It's quite funny to watch depending what, what sat-nav you've got. Um, so it's also about using it in the right context. Uh, but then again, I always tell GIS people who always, you know, by default, try to put everything on the map that you have to remember a map is just one data representation out of many. So. Um, I'm not advocating at all that just because you can put it on the map, you should. Or even that just because you can put it in GIS, you should. Uh, it's really, you need to create solutions that, that users need. You know? Otherwise, you end up with shortcuts like this. And um, yeah, so also the solution is more than just a technology. I think this is all well understood, but rarely done well <laughs> for some reason. So um, I see that a lot as well as consultant. So, as a consultant, I spend all my time on, on, on the bits that are not technical, really, which is quite ironic, really, but, but that's, that's the reality. Um, yeah, I'll skip over this a bit more quickly, because uh, all, the, all the technology deployment issues are really people issues, and the complexity goes up the more people you have, uh, especially with flattening of organizations where individuals do their own thing more and more, and yet they need to work in concert with each other. Um, it's really about uh, joining it up properly. Um, and bringing it back to GIS, um, it's really, um, when GIS works at its best, it's actually when you don't over-engineer it, when you have really simple maps that do really simple things, but they just work. This is an example I came across recently in Atlanta, where um, they, um, 
they created the Child Wellbeing Index, which is a really simple map. You can see it as kind of like a heat map. And they've used that map um, in the council there, local council there, to, to redirect employment opportunities to those red areas where there is low child well-being. And, um, and they've worked with employers like UPS, I think, the logistics company, and they've opened new work centers there. And those companies have opened new warehouses there and stuff to create employment. And it's a really simple thing to do. You have a simple map, you see where, where there is a need, you put your employment there, and they've achieved some amazing results. And, uh, and yet I see a lot of examples of over-engineered 3D, 4D, this and that maps that hardly achieve anything, frankly. And then you see something like this, and it's, it's amazing. Um, also, what I really like is story maps, so-called story maps, where uh, the GIS bit is integrated with multimedia, uh, which is a great way of, of storytelling, as the name implies. But it makes it a lot more... Um, humanly cons consumable, so it's a lot more, you, you reach people at a lot more an emotional level uh, rather than just giving them the raw data or even or the, the analysis on the map. Uh, if you can illustrate something with pictures or, or, or like with video or with links or newspaper articles or whatever, problem they're working on, it's, it's a lot more digestible and, and it tells the story much better. And then you might ask, uh, do we still need maps at all? Um, with, all <coughs> with all the journey we've been on since moving from the analog world to digital and now transforming digitally, where we are reimagining uh, processes from scratch, actually, because initially all the digitization was just transposing an analog process to an electronic one without changing it. Whereas now we're reimagining all of these processes completely with digital. Uh, in a lot of cases, you don't actually need a map anymore, even though you're still using the spatial intelligence behind it. Um, and that trend kind of first started in the early 2010s. This is an, uh, an article from 2012 where they said, well, the future of the map isn't the map. It's what's behind the map. Um, and indeed, um, I worked for a company in the past where we generated automatic reports, environmental risk reports, for example, where um, the end consumer, who in that case was um, um, a home or prospective homeowner who, who wanted, who was interested in a particular property, they would just want to know is this property at risk of flooding, and all they want to know is yes or no. They're not interested in the detail of where it might flood or how. Um, they're not really interested in in seeing where the house is, because they already know that. They just want a yes, no answer. And so you're still using the same intelligence, you're just not presenting it with a map. Um, another example here, what three words you might have heard of that. So that's a way of encoding location with a unique combination of, of three random words. Um, and um, you can see, I can see that working well, for example, at the music festival. You're trying to meet up with some friends in the middle of a field, but you have them on the phone, where shall we meet? Well, by that tree that looks like, uh, but by the oak tree, um, or by the, you know, by the tent, by the circus tent, or whatever, it's really quite difficult. Whereas with this, um, they've just gridded the whole world into three by three meter squares, and um, each of those squares has a unique three word ID, and makes it easy to con confer that location via voice. Uh, I'll put down this BCS office there as well. And what, what's good as well over this is you can actually direct people to the exact entrance location. With a lot of buildings, you don't know where the entrance is. And with this, you can do that kind of thing. So, uh, also, if you order anything online, um, I mean, the logistics there, the route optimization and, and, and the tracking of, of your parcel is done with the GIS system effectively. But you don't see the map of that. All you want to know is when it's going to arrive. So that spatial intelligence is given to you in an email. It will arrive at 1 o'clock or whatever. But you don't need to show the map for that. So you see more and more of these spatial applications. They are GIS applications, but they don't have a map interface. Right, just changing gears a little bit. So we've now talked about all the progress um, uh, with the technology, uh, with GIS, and, and all the journey we've been on with that. So now I want to bring it back to a kind of more human 
human level as well. And um, that's, like I said, it's something that's close to my heart. And um, yeah, I just spent a few minutes on that. The first thing I want to say is what's really interesting, uh, the example I showed earlier with the 3D IoT model there, um, they also, you know, that same city, uh, they also use like a physical model with wooden blocks of their city to have meetings and to do, do planning meetings or to, to uh, have open meetings with the public to consult opinion. Because for some reason, you just can't beat a model that's actually physically in front of you uh, to something that's on the screen. Um, especially when you do open meetings with the public where not everybody is computer literate or spatially literate or whatever. And it, it creates a really nice way of interacting and exchanging ideas and information. And then you just see that again and again. Once you start looking for this kind of thing, you start seeing it everywhere. You know, architects, even though they use sophisticated 3D models in AutoCAD, they still also build models in wood and in cardboard and everything, because there's just no other way of really, really getting a feel for it. And, um, and yeah, I mean, also getting out into the field. You know, we're, we're glued to our screens these days. Um, when I think back, you know, some of our best times where I actually learned the most was not behind a computer, it was really being out in the field. And, and this place here in the Sahara just blew my mind, just the open spaces, it's just amazing. And you get a real feel for what the challenges are. Um, and yeah, it, it really made me think this kind of thing as well. You know, we've been on this evolution of technology, and whichever use case you look at, um, whether it's extracting oil from the ground and getting it into people's cars or whatever it is, um, if you on a on a kind of reality TV program like The Apprentice or, or The Island or something like Bear Grylls Island, where you have nothing, you have to start from scratch and you'd have to invent a new way of doing whatever you want to do. I always wonder, at what point would we invent office buildings full of rows of computers that people stare at all day long? I've no idea. I don't, I don't think we would, would we? It's just crept up on us slowly. It's just become a habit. And whenever we solve, want to solve a problem, the first thing we do, we go and sit in front of a computer. And I think it's the worst place to solve a problem. But um, so either computers have to become more human and we don't notice them anymore and we can have them everywhere without even thinking, or we need to learn to, we need to learn when to engage with a computer and when to step away from it, I don't know. Yeah, because ultimately, you know, people love using their hands um, and um, there are actually um, neurological reasons for that. Um, if you remember your school lessons, um, the hands actually occupy a large part of your brain in terms of input and output. You know, if you remember these diagrams. And, um, and actually, I've been reading up on stuff like that. And actually, by using your hands, you can access about 80% of the knowledge that's in your brain. Um, so, and yet, when we're looking at screens, we're not, we're not using our hands, so we can't access all the knowledge that's in our brain. So, um, and yeah, remember that one. So that's probably why they're reversing you know, some of those changes to use hands and you know, where you use levers and stuff. And I've been wondering, how can we do this with spatial stuff? How can we do more of that stuff with spatial? And, um, and indeed, um, I mean, this is quite niche. It's a bit of a hipster thing to do to hand draw maps. But um, if you look around, there's still some people who actually do it, like meteorologists when they draw their local forecast. So, um, a lot of them still do that by hand. And of course, you could write an algorithm that interpolates the ISO lines or whatever it is they draw. But uh, that algorithm would never capture all the experience in the meteorologist's head and all the intuition that they've built up, especially about their local area. Because when they draw the ISO line, they don't just draw it exactly between, between the data points. They kind of draw it with the knowledge of the local area a historical knowledge of what the weather has been like, what, what it might influence, uh, and any features that might influence the weather locally. Um, and ultimately, you could encode all of that in an algorithm, but it would take you forever, because to encode everything that's in the human brain um, would be quite an undertaking. So there are still areas where the hand is unbeatable, even for drawing maps. And uh, there's probably 
areas in non-spatial areas, um, non-spatial stuff where the same goes through, like just, just like the taking notes. I've read a lot about how writing notes by hand in a notebook still helps you understand the information better and recall it better as well. So there's, there's all that kind of stuff going on. I was also pleased to see at a, at a GIS conference, this was an open source conference a few years ago, that uh, the first cartographic prize was won by a hand-drawn map as well. So, well, I'm sure they used GIS to do the initial outline and then just traced over it, but nevertheless, it was nice to see. And, um, but what's also encouraging is, um, even though, you know, when you sit in front of a computer, you don't use your hands so much, but what is happening is that there's a convergence again of art uh, with all the technology stuff. So, and that's not something, that's something we haven't seen in like 200 years since the beginning of industrialization. Um, because throughout the industrialization, we've become more and more specialized. You know, and in school, you're told you can either be a scientist or an engineer or an artist, but you can't be everything. When we're in reality, you know, why not? You know, we're not born engineers. We're not born artists. When you, when you look at a room full of children, you ask them who can draw, all the hands go up. When you ask them who can jump, all the hands go up. So there's nobody who's who feels they can't do anything up to a certain age, and then once they've had enough exposure with adults, then they start believing they can't do everything. But, um, but yeah, so that's quite encouraging as well, so um, that there's more of a convergence again between, between different fields. And, and that's where real skill comes in. Creating a map like this takes real skill. Uh, that's an example I came across on the internet a, a few weeks ago as well. <laughs> Um, you see, this is a map that, that tracks two variables at once, inequality and income in Switzerland. And it's done that quite elegantly. And it's done it in a way that only shows it in the area where people actually live. Now, you always see these political maps with political colors, red, blue, and quite a lot of these areas are completely empty of people, so it's completely misleading. Whereas to create a true, uh, uh, to create a true map that's truly representative of what, what's actually going on is, is quite a skill still. And it's not something you can easily automate. It really takes human input to do that right. Um, and it's quite funny to see now that people are beginning to embed more and more human-like features again into technology. So this is like sketchy edge styling in, in, in ArcGIS, for example, where it's made to look like it's drawn by a human hand, you know, where it's got, it's got these sketchy wiggles on it to, to make it look purposefully out of, out of line a little bit. So, and it makes, it makes it somehow more understandable, strangely. So we obviously react to that very well. So um, yeah, here's, here's a watercolor thing. This has not been drawn by a human hand. This has been computer generated in a GIS. Um, and... Um, it looks surprisingly nice. So even, even though computers generated this, just because it looks more human, I find it more easy to read the map somehow. It doesn't work in every use case, but uh, in some cases it works well. Yeah, um, coming back to 3, 3D models in, in the real world, you know, physical models, like I said, architects still do models. Urban planners have used Legos to model urban challenges. I've seen that quite a few times. I myself have experimented uh, with Lego Serious Play, which is a methodology um, to get people together and brainstorm ideas or um, um, to work on, on user require, imagine user requirements or, or team visions or that kind of thing, innovation workshops. And uh, it works remarkably well. It's a, it's a real, uh, it means that, that in the whole room, everybody participates equally um, because of this process and because of the modeling, and it's very intuitive. And, um, and it also enables conversations about ideas um, more equally because it focuses people's attentions on the model rather than on the people. So it's a lot less, um, um, a lot less controversial sometimes, especially when you're talking about stuff that is more... Um, so yeah, so uh, there's, uh, so if anybody wants to run a Lego w workshop, let me know. I'd be happy to facilitate one for you. Um, 
Well, yeah, in reality, I guess you, 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 need, you need both worlds. And, and there are ways to bring, bring both a digital and analog world together. Um, so um, air traffic controllers, for example, to this day, even though they obviously use digital screens, uh, they still to this day use strips of paper um, to organize their planes that they, they direct because there, there, there simply isn't anything better. Um, so you need to use both. And there's other ways of doing both as well. So it's still a, an open-ended question for me. How can we do more of this with spatial or otherwise? Because um, I think it would make our work more enjoyable as well. Anyway, um, just a few final thoughts then. Um, so is spatial special? I don't know. You always hear people go on about that. Um, I'll leave that up, up to you to decide. You could say it is special in some ways and not special in others, just like Schrodinger's cat. Um, is uh, if you don't know what Schrodinger's cat is, it's from the world uh, from the quant uh, from the world of quantum physics, where an object can be both there and not there at the same time. Um, I could explain it to you if I understood it, but I don't, so I won't. Um, well, yeah. So you have some special things like where you really need ingenuity, where spatial is special. Like I, I do love this projection. <coughs> which is a particular projection. You know how difficult it is to project the round Earth to a flat surface on the map. And, um, and this projection has got multiple projection points, and they're optimized so that all the world's oceans are one contiguous water body. And um, it's just amazing. I love it. But then again, like I said, you know, this is just one way of representing data out of many. So, um, so in that regard, not special. And if um, any of this has inspired you to enter the geospatial area, um, geospatial domain, you can do it via many different routes. Um, there's actually not many people who, who go to university to study GIS or geomatics per se. I started off as a land surveyor and geodesist and then did GIS later. But um, I don't know how you got into the field, Ed. But <laughs> There's a lot of geologists who end up doing GIS and then maybe the other way around as well even. So but you can go from lots of different professions and be exposed to it. Um, and, uh, and then here's, here's a few sample rows that there are in the geospatial area. Uh, this is more comprehensive. I've just repurposed this slide from something else. But um, uh, there's lots of different things you can do. And what's happening now is kind of this trend towards spatial data science. Um, Initially, there was a lot of rebranding going on there from you know, almost all of a sudden, overnight, everybody was a spatial data scientist, um, <coughs> just like you see in other areas, I guess. So, um, but there, there is a convergence of data management and GIS in, into data science, I think, especially considering that data science, even to this day, is mostly data cleanup, really, let's face it. So. Um, Whenever I speak to data scientists, it's kind of, they always speak of frustrations of cleaning, formatting. Um, it's really like all the effort that goes into it before you can actually do any analysis on it. Um, and also this issue here with shape files and Excel files, that probably won't go away either. So there's still quite a bit of work on the data management side yet, I think. Um, However, I think with the emergence of IoT type sensors and with more and more automation, also with machine learning and AI and all that, I do I would expect that as more and more data becomes natively digital and automated, it is already cleaned at source. It's already programmed to be that way at source. So would there still be any data management? And I don't know. I hope not. It would be good if there wasn't. Um, but if you think about that, I mean, then data management really does become analytics because then what you do is you, you really look at the, what the outputs are and, and you start charting the output and seeing what, what the trends are. And um, there won't be any of that traditional data management loading and all that stuff, you know. What was it? I was tired. Cleaning up. <laughs> Cleaning up for, yeah, the tape transcriptions. Do you remember those? Um, yeah, so, um, so yeah. So uh, there's some, because um, we've been talking about that for at least a few hours in for 20 years. Yeah, yeah, we need to do more analysis. That's where the real value is. And yet we always 
all this down in the weeds, cleaning up shapefiles. And um, so, yeah, it's moving closer to that way, I think. So, yeah, so just to wrap up, you know, you can do a lot with maps. Um, just remember that maps aren't just maps. They've got a GIS behind them. And um, there's a lot that goes on there, a lot you can do with it. And as we go into this century with all the challenges we've got, I'm currently working on energy transition as well. So I've looked into all the, all the solutions to the climate crisis as well. And uh, so I've listed those that, are, that I keep, keep seeing repeated everywhere. Um, and they've got all of them, I've got geospatial written all over it. So um, yeah, even when we step away from oil and gas, and, and that will happen, um, there's still lots of work to do. I, th I think there'll be more work to do than ever, to be honest. So, um, so yeah. So that's it. So um, the world needs spatial data, and the world needs you to do amazing things with spatial data. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. You, you mean a use case yeah. example? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can just go to their website. It's, it's a free app. Yeah. If what three words? What three words? Just go to their website, and you can just. Um, you don't even have to download the app. Do you can just use the yeah, the map interface there. Yeah, it's all about laying down the infrastructure um, that you lay down the spatial tools, the tool set that that's in place, and then you make it as easy as possible for people to create their own widgets or apps within that, or, or just use whatever you make available. So you just so, using the same technology based upon the same... Yeah, and especially the large multinationals, they, their IT environments are completely locked down anyway, so as an end user, you can't install anything that's not approved. Uh, in smaller companies, they're more nimble and flexible anyway, so you actually wouldn't want to lock it down because then it goes against everything they want to do anyway. But um, So, yeah, it's, um, it's more about providing the support and the education about it and, and, and then like, giving them the tools and just letting them do it. Yeah, is that assuming you already got all the traditional GIS skills or geospatial skills, or you start from scratch? It's, can it, it's, it's, is it easy to use um, a new kind of approach that's really not just a set of okay. uh, information okay. that you can piece together, but still, it's not written in the rules of the game. Yeah, okay, more school level. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it's more for school level. No, I, I, what would you say to that school for any of us that want to do more priority? Yeah. Okay. Well. Um. Yeah, like I said. Um. I mean, when I work with organisations that have already GIS in place, and most of them do, um, they have an existing capability of traditional GIS skills. So what I encourage them to do is, is yes, they need more analytical skills, um, 
but also um, the focus on the integrity of spatial data, you know, bringing it all together in like this spatial jigsaw where you get the data streams coming from left, right, and center, and you, and you need you need a team to look after that after that to make sure it's all in the right place. And then, uh, yeah, uh, and then the, the human element of it, you know, there are certain things where you really need a human, you cannot automate everything. Um, so it's more of a, the, the understanding of spatial um, bringing, the, the, the ability to use spatial data to tell a story and to actually solve a problem. But problem solving is a real issue that I come across everywhere, and that's a generic issue, not particular spatial, but um, still too many people start with a solution, they see a new tool or whatever, and they think, well, so what can we do with this? Well, let's complete it the wrong way around. So also with schools, um, we can't really teach them about GIS now, because 10 years when they go into the workforce, it will have all changed beyond recognition anyway. So it's more about problem solving, more about a spatially literate problem solving, using geography to solve problems, I would say. so. It's a good question, it's a tough one, because you don't really know what the world looks like 10 years from now. So maybe, maybe I'll, I'll go to a question that I think it actually follows on quite nicely from yours, but it's about open street map. And the fact that uh, you've got some areas that are well covered, some areas that are less so. So I think to try to coexist with this more conventional GIS work, but that also could be a platform to say, actually, if you're a school kid, why don't you talk about your area? Because mm -hmm. there is a sort of syndrome I've probably heard called the Park and Zoo type. So you've got bits of open street map where you can move it quite easily from this area. All houses, there's park benches, there's, there's lots of things, there's part of the road, and there's other areas, and there's desert. There's loads to do out there. And that might be a way of encouraging people to, to progress. Yeah. I mean, what's your views on that? Yeah, well, that actually, you, you saying that reminds me of another thing, which is um, we could reframe the question as well. Do we need to teach our geospatial specialists to be even even deeper experts or should we educate the wider public more in geospatial literacy? And you may get more results with educating the wider public just the way that I advise organizations to sprinkle everything with spatial magic rather than having a big GIS fortress in one corner of the organization. So you might achieve, but again, the question is what problem are you trying to solve? Um, but if I mean, for example, the public could probably do with being more literate with statistics in general and spatial data in particular as well, also to help the political discourse maybe, I don't know. Um, so it's maybe with that you get more results than, than churning out a few more super duper specialists. So, so yeah, it's, uh, well, it's a tricky question. Uh. Yeah, that's great. Well, you're doing the right thing then, obviously, yeah. And uh, like I said in my presentation, story maps are, are a really good format to engage people because they're not too technical and they engage people at a more emotional level. So also for children, um, I think that would be a really good format. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, all the story map does really is geocode the story, geocode the narrative. So. Um, what, what's 
short in terms of versions, but 3D GIS with that 3D modeling for the IT world, the two worlds seem to be coming in together. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, like I say, I'm not an expert in that field. I've never worked in the architectural problems of building industry, but um, yeah, it's a, the integration is definitely closer now. I mean, if you look at the mainstream GIS products, they, they all have um, integration with CAD as default, uh, but that doesn't take away from the issues about spatial referencing. Um, and the way GIS deals with that is when you load a, a CAD model in, it kind of rubber sheets it to make it fit a little bit to the to the projection in the GIS. And there's always a bit of wiggle there. There's it's never quite perfect. So you really, you really have to be aware of that depending on what your needs are in terms of tolerances. But for most practical purposes, if you just want to visualize something, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a few centimeters out of place. Uh, but if you're doing engineering design, then it does matter. So. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. Like I say, it's an organizational issue as well. Yeah. And, and when you create spatial data, um, it's about people being aware that you know, that data may be used beyond their particular use case that they've envisaged. So ideally, they should be creating it or acquiring it in a way that, that is universally usable. Yeah, I had a bit of exposure to the insurance industry um, for when I worked for a company a few years ago. There was we, we were producing these environmental risk reports and flood reports and all that. We worked on a project to collect all flood risk information in one place for reinsurers. Um, I did work with a number of companies there. They had their in-house modeling teams, and they you know they modeled risk using geospatial data from wherever they could get it from. And, and it was seen as a competitive advantage, so they didn't want to share it really. Uh, so, and you, but exactly, you want that data to be shared because, but yeah, it's tricky because there's, there's competing interests. Um, but in a way, it's nice that geospatial is seen as a competitive advantage. You know, you could look at it that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're doing the same things. I guess they, they they're getting it from wherever they can get it from, and there's suppliers who well, uh, um, who produce that data. Also commercially, um, 
that they can buy it from. And yeah, but there's not there's not a lot of sharing going on in that industry, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Yeah, there's earthquake modeling and flood modeling and all kinds of like kind of yeah. <laughs> and they, have, they, have, they, all, they all have different resolutions as well, and so yeah. yeah. Will AI ever replace? That's kind of the general question. Will AI ever replace humans, except for the geospatial context within that? Uh, I would hope not. Um, but if you look at where the curve is going, then probably we'll reach that curve at some point, unless the climate crisis has finished us all off before that. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean. It, the question maybe should be reframed, is it what we want? I mean, because is it, is it inevitable? So it doesn't have to be, does it? Yeah. Possibly. I mean, you could see in a hospital doctor using AI to help interpret an X-ray, and there it's clearly helpful, and it, it prevents errors. But still, the, the, as a surgeon, you have, you, you've got the ultimate, ultimate, you, make you, you, you make the decision. So um, I wouldn't want to be lying in a hospital bed and an AI algorithm deciding what's going to happen to me. Just emotionally, whether it's better for me or not, I wouldn't know. But yeah. just emotionally, that would not, I would not like that. Mm -hmm. Geospatially, though, <clears throat> unless it's a life and death thing, but ultimately, you could automate a lot of things. And even things like, for example, like, like we talked about this what three words um, algorithm but makes it easy to relay a, a location via voice. Well, if everything's automated, you don't need to relay anything via voice. Then you just, like with emergency services, if you ring 999, at least what should happen is uh, there's an AML standard on your phone that automatically provides the call center with your exact location. There's no need to give them, <coughs> there's no need to say, uh, I'm at OS, grid reference, blah, de, blah, or I'm at what three words, whatever, because the phone has already done it. Or at least that's, that's, that's what's supposed to happen. So in that sense, geospatial analysis could get automated completely under the hood, I guess. But then again, how do you create like, like that Swiss map I showed, where it's really a difficult problem and you need to find a way of, of really telling that story and making it comprehensible? I don't think an AI will ever do that, or at least not in my lifetime. Yeah, I mean, privacy relates to your personal data where you've been, your own personal movements, doesn't it? And you, you, I mean, you have some power. You can switch location tracking off on your phone. 
I don't completely trust that it's completely switching it off because um, yeah. these devices seem to track whatever even when you switch them completely off. I don't know. But the secret service will have something to say about it, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, then your choice becomes you don't carry a phone around. But even then, you've got all the CCTV tracking you. Uh, with, and that's getting more sophisticated, like with, with AI algorithms to, to track faces and stuff. And then your last refuge is the countryside. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know. But it's, that's, that's more of a political discussion, I think. Because uh, if we just let it happen, like I said, at what point did we decide we all want to sit in offices staring at computers all day long? We never took that decision consciously. It just happened to us gradually. And if we don't do anything, then this thing will happen to us gradually. And AI will take over gradually. So it's, um, it's reaching a point where we need to ask more why questions. You know, why are we doing this? Which problem is this solving? I suppose the whole legal system is about humans. It's not about machines. No, so it's uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Thank you very much.